Hello, weary adventurers. Rest your burdens a moment. Maybe some food will help restore you. I'm preparing some stew I learned to make in my time in Red Dead Redemption too. So, sit by the fire, and I'll tell you how I learned how to make it. We'll first begin by talking about what's explicitly known about the stew. Pearson, the camp cook, starts every morning cutting the meat that's stored in a barrel full of salt. The cut or kind of meat isn't too important, because he'll accept any donated meat be it something like common pig or cow, something hunted like bear or deer, or something unexpected like squirrel or alligator. We also know that Miss Grimshaw asks Arthur to bring her some herbs so she can slip it into the stew, two of which I'll be working with, oregano and thyme. Ah, excellent, thank you. I'll slip these in Pearson's pot when he's not looking. Throughout the story, stew appears to be eaten many times, making it almost like a classic dish to the region. And each time it's been eaten, potatoes and carrots are always used. Considering it's not just the gang's circumstances, but maybe even the people living in this time, root vegetables are a great staple because of their long shelf life. For our friends here, whether they are escaping from the law, or making do with what little money they have, buying food that won't spoil next week is a necessity. That's why, after buying provisions from the general store, the wagon is loaded mostly with flour, potatoes, and boxes of tinned food, things that have a long shelf life. One of those tinned goods they keep on the food wagon is a can of Schmitz's baked beans. In the general store's catalog, the description for this reads, baked beans in a tomato sauce. I'm assuming this is also going to go into the stew for a few reasons. Not only would it make the stew be more filling, but the baked beans would help give that reddish-orange color. It was also common in this time period to add ketchup, as explained in this cookbook. The American Frugal Housewife, written by Lydia Maria Child. I'm referencing this book because not only does it have authentic 19th century recipes, but it was also read for poor families, or in Miss Child's own words, for those who are not ashamed of economy. It isn't a cookbook that asks for expensive ingredients, and it doesn't assume the reader has a housemaid, which many books of the time did. The cookbook became very successful at helping families, and I'd like to believe if her cookbook existed in Red Dead, then Pearson may have learned a thing or two from her. Maybe he learned how to preserve meat from this section in the book. Some people corn meat by throwing it into their beef barrel for a few days, but this method does not make it so sweet. A little saltpeter rubbed in before you apply the common salt makes the meat tender. Since Pearson has to keep any donated meat in a brine barrel, it makes sense why it takes him a few days to make the stew. It needs to be stored in a barrel for a few days, and then in some cases the meat needs to be soaked in water overnight, as detailed in Child's book. In this next section in the cookbook is a recipe for beef soup. It reads, A lemon cut up and put in half an hour before it's done adds to the flavor. If you have tomato catsup in the house, a cupful will make the soup rich. Mom? Schmitz's baked beans is made with tomato sauce, and that's a great thing to add to the stew. I took what I observed from Pearson, what I noticed around the camp, and I used an influential cookbook from its time to make today's supper. It's beefsteak when I'm hungry, and whiskey when I'm dry. Greenbacks when I'm hard up, and hell when I die. The first part of this is to prepare the salted beef. I want to work with the preserved meat similar to what Pearson would have worked with before I make this stew. I'm using Child's recipe, but I'm scaling down the ratio of ingredients to work with a 2.5 pound of brisket because I'm also trying to be economical. I began by making the wet brine by boiling salt, brown sugar, salt cure, and molasses, making sure to skim the top as needed. I figured a 5 minute boil was probably more than enough time for everything to get dissolved. So I turned off the burner and let the pot cool down to room temp. Instead of a barrel, I'm using a container and I'll be setting down a layer of kosher salt. Then we'll add a layer of beef, add more salt to cover the top, and add another layer of beef. And then add some more salt. Make sure that everything is compact. There should not be any air space in there. Just keep it very compact. Once the brine is cool, pour it into the container. And some of the beef ended up floating, so I put in a plate to weigh it down because the beef needs to be completely submerged. Put the lid on, and normally the barrel would have to keep in a cool place like a cellar, 
so I'm just going to put mine in the fridge for a few days. Side note, back then they would have to place a rock on top of the barrel's lid to keep it closed. So four days later, I'm taking this barrel out of the fridge and replacing the water. This step was normally taken the day before it's cooked so that the excess salt would transfer into the clean water. At this stage, if you were to squeeze the meat it would feel a lot more solid than you'd expect. Not quite the same solidity as frozen meat, but pretty close. It's now the next day and finally we'll start making the stew itself. I drained the water from our barrel here and the meat is now a lot softer, so that's good. Put the meat into the pot with just enough fresh water to cover the meat and bring that to a gentle boil and let it roll for one and a half hours. Skim off the top as needed. Next, drain the pot into a colander and set the meat aside. Here I added 12 cups of fresh water back into a pot and brought that to a boil before adding the meat again. As Miss Grimshaw would request, I added a half tablespoon of ground thyme and half a tablespoon of dried oregano. Like I said, once the pot of water is boiling, we add the meat back into the pot. I also added black pepper because I'm pretty sure I saw a pepper shaker in the game. Let that cook for 2 hours. After a couple hours, I added 28 ounces of baked beans to the stew and 2 slices of lemon. Seems strange to me to add sliced lemon, but it's what the recipe calls for. Let that cook for 10 minutes. After that time has passed, then we add the potatoes that have been sliced thinly and carrots. Stir everything in and then add more water if needed and some flour to thicken the stew. I really didn't understand what the book meant when it asked for 2 cups of water and flour so I foolishly added 1 cup of flour. Don't do that, just add 2 tablespoons of flour. Let everything cook for the last 30 minutes and then it'll be done. This took a lot of time even though the recipe is pretty simple. Eating the stew just felt like fuel, not necessarily a dish I'd request again. The taste of the beans and lemon come through the most. At times the lemon was too much and then in other bites the lemon was in the background and tasted quite nice. I think a squeeze of lemon instead of adding slices of lemon would have distributed the flavor better. You may have noticed I didn't add any extra salt to the stew and frankly it was perfectly salted because of the salted beef. But the beef was stringy. When I chewed it, I could feel the individual strands coming apart instead of melting in my mouth. It's not bad or inedible, but it tastes incomplete. Still, it was cool to learn how to cook like they did in the 19th century, but I'm glad we live in a time where food is better.